I have been privileged to work in many parts of Africa over my career, but nothing compares to the rugged natural beauty of Congo. An enormous amount of the country has been untouched by man for so long. I think I am drawn to Congo year after year because of the country's astonishing diversity, its landscape, biodiversity, and people. As a biologist, this place is a treasure trove of undiscovered new species to science, and the thrill of discovery is very exciting. With Congo, one never knows what horrifying or exhilarating experience is just around the corner. My name is Eli Greenbaum, and I am an associate professor of evolutionary genetics here at UTEP. Uh, currently in my lab, I have uh, two PhD students, Frank Portillo and Danny Hughes. Uh, Frank is working on a dissertation about snakes, and Danny is, is working on chameleons. And for the last two years, uh, Danny has uh, accompanied me into the field. So in 2014, uh, we spent a little bit of time in Uganda and several punishing weeks in, in Congo. It was a very difficult trip and Danny did great. And then last year, Danny spent at least two months in Uganda collecting chameleon specimens for his dissertation work. The, the trips have been the best part, going to Africa um, in Uganda and the Congo and seeing these animals alive you know, in their natural habitat and seeing you know, various populations that most people haven't seen in a very long time. I think that has been the most exciting part. And then of course, um, bringing it back into the lab and confirming some of the qualitative observations we had in the field on differences between populations um, and then using genetics to kind of figure these things out. Um, it's been very interesting and exciting. As a herpetologist and evolutionary biologist, I am interested in understanding the evolutionary history of amphibians and reptiles in Central Africa, including the processes that have contributed to their speciation patterns and the identification of new species to science. <laughs> This evolutionary history can be elucidated with DNA data that are analyzed in the laboratory. But first, we must obtain DNA samples from wild animals that are often difficult to find. Did you find something? Not yet. Mm -hmm. My Congolese colleagues and I travel to very remote areas of Congo in search of these animals, often for many weeks at a time. In general, the biodiversity of Congo is arguably the most poorly known of any terrestrial area in the world. Although a couple of Belgian herpetologists, including Raymond Laurent, published an impressive amount of information about the amphibians and reptiles of Congo in the 20th century, they barely scratch the surface of the enormous amount of species diversity that is now known from the country. New species have been discovered during each of our nine expeditions to Congo, and it is likely that many additional new species await discovery. Congo is a difficult place to work for many reasons, most of which are related to the country's brutal history of exploitation. For hundreds of years, Congo was devastated by slavery. Then in the 19th century, about half the population was killed while Belgian colonizers got rich from ivory and rubber exports. And in the 20th century, the United States and the World Bank sent billions of dollars in aid to the dictator Mobutu, who stole most of it to enrich himself and his friends. And in 1994, the militias responsible for the Rwandan genocide fled to Congo and started a conflict that led to Africa's world war, 
which eventually claimed over 5 million lives. As a result of this devastating history, Congo is now considered to be the poorest and least developed country in the world. Okay, crossing a very large creek. Oh God. Okay, punch it Chewy. Let's go. All right. No problem. Because of Congo's troubled history, most of the country's infrastructure is destroyed, including roads, bridges, electricity access, and hospitals. This reality creates many challenges for logistics and transportation during expeditions. Our trucks often take a beating on the bad roads. And when we get stuck in the mud for hours at a time, my team takes a beating too but we always try to keep our sense of humor intact. It is very bad road from Fizi to the Tombwe. Yeah. And now too much mud, very bad road. Okay, are you gonna clean that stuff up now? Yeah, no, I must, I want to, to read, I want to see the river so then I can clean. Okay. Oh yeah, that's it. too much problems in the road. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. In many areas where the roads are completely destroyed, we must rely on motorcycle transport to reach remote field sites. Or in some places, the only way to get around is with dugout canoe on rivers. And in some cases, we travel by dugout and motorcycle. Other challenges include mountainous terrain. The steep and treacherous path through the Atomway Plateau is especially difficult in the rain. Jumbo shift. Jumbo sana. Okay. Dio. Havar gani. Mzuri. Dio. Then there are biting and stinging insects, a nasty spider disguised as an ant, and a camp deep in the forest that was situated a little too close to a hive of bees. I have one in my pants. Head it back. Some of these insects, including mosquitoes and tsetse flies, can cause serious tropical diseases. These diseases range from potentially deadly to wish you were dead. As herpetologists, we are actually looking for venomous snakes, but one must be very careful because the hospitals are usually in poor condition and located very far away from remote field sites. Uh -huh. Back in 2009, uh, we were working in a place called uh, Lavangi, which is in uh, eastern Congo. It's near the, the border with Burundi. And we told them, hey, you know, if you happen to kill uh, a snake near your house, you know, please bring it to us because we can still get a DNA sample out of it. Because over there, there are many different species of venomous snakes. People kill them all the time because they don't want something to happen to themselves, their children, uh, or the animals that they have uh, around their house. Within a few hours, actually, these guys show up with a basket tied to their bicycle, open it up and like, wow, you know, what did these guys get? So my colleague walks over, looks inside, and he's like, oh, that's a Samophis. And I was really excited because Samophis are nearly impossible to catch. They're like lightning. So I look inside the basket, and instead of seeing a brown snake with a pointy snout, I saw this. And as you can see, this is a medium-sized brown snake, but it does not have a pointy snout, it's actually quite round. So, after some choice words, I backed away from the basket. Everybody put on sunglasses because you do not want venom from a black neck spitting cobra in your eye. One of the men who has been working with me for 
uh, several years, is a very experienced snake handler. So he took out a wooden stick and basically pinned it behind the neck. Everything was going great. And then his assistant walked around to help him restrain it. And the snake squeezed the muscle on its head and uh, a, a little jet of venom came flying out and hit the assistant Juan Dege right in the eye. So the only um, tool available to us to um, help with the suffering is milk. And in, in Congo, there, there aren't too many 7-Elevens around the corner. So the, the only thing we could do uh, to help this guy was to find a woman who was nursing. And then he had to lay down in her lap and she had to squeeze some milk into his eye to neutralize the venom. Despite these difficult challenges, I never forget that I'm extremely privileged to work in the shrinking areas of Central Africa that are still wild. Since the 1970s, Africa's wildlife has been devastated and many iconic animals are slipping away to extinction. Bonjour. How are you? What are you laughing at, Aristotle? <laughs> yeah. Because uh, of how you, you are greeting those child, children. Mm -hmm. The man of saying bonjour was funny. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. That is why I... Your American has an accent, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Instead of bonjour, you said bonjour. It was long. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> the cultural traditions of different tribes of Congo are also disappearing in the 21st century as they move out of the forest and into farming villages. Even so, we have experienced some unique encounters with the people of the Congo. Some of these children have never seen a white man before. Here, a boy from the Lendu tribe in northeastern Congo plays a tune from the Jugu a harp-like musical instrument. You may notice he is suffering from tropical ulcers on his legs. And here's a group of pygmy girls in traditional costumes celebrating the birth of a child. Central Africa's pygmies are famous as relatively short hunter-gatherer nomads. My team has been very fortunate to work with multiple Mbuti and Aka pygmy tribes who are excellent hunters that have helped us find many rare animals. Okay. 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 Hello, Eli. Are you okay with your people? Yeah, everything's okay. Okay. Very nice to see them. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the name of this village again? No. 
Is it just plantation, that's all you told me. Yes. Plantation avec la combine. Bon pour tout. Bon pour tout? Eh. Plantation comme la plantation. Ikuto aussi. Ah, ikuto. Ikuto. Ikuto aussi. Okay. The name of plantation is Okay. Ikuto, okay. Everything's okay. Searching for amphibians and reptiles in the forests of Congo is a labor-intensive process that happens at all hours of the day and night. Here my Congolese colleagues Wandege and Aristote are searching for frogs that are hiding in the leaf litter of a swamp. One of the ways to distinguish different species of frogs from each other is to record the male's mating calls. DNA is an abbreviation for deoxyribonucleic acid, a double helix molecule that is found in the chromosomes of all living things on planet Earth. The transfer of hereditary material through generations of closely related individuals is accomplished via DNA. All amphibian and reptile species that we encounter in Congo are sampled for their DNA so that they can be analyzed in the Evolutionary Genetics Laboratory at the University of Texas at El Paso and voucher specimens are collected for the UTEP biodiversity collections, which are absolutely crucial for new species to be formally described. Once the genetic data have been analyzed, we can see how the different species are related to each other and identify so-called cryptic species, which look identical to each other, but are genetically distinct species. For example, if we have two similar looking brown snakes that live in different areas of Central Africa, we might suspect that they are the same species. But many times when we analyze the DNA, we find that they are completely different species, and in some cases, aren't even each other's closest relatives. Here is a great example of the value of specimens in natural history collections. In a recent analysis of DNA sequence data from different samples of the olive house snake in Central Africa, we discovered two distinct genetic lineages, one from the lowland rainforest and another from the mountains of the border of eastern Congo. When we looked at the number of scales on the belly of the specimens in our biodiversity collections, we discovered that the lowland lineage had fewer numbers of belly scales than the montane lineage. When we integrated all of this evidence together, we realized we had discovered a cryptic species in the mountains, and in 2015, this was described as a new species called Boedon radfordi. Here are some other examples of the new species of amphibians and reptiles that have been described from this research so far. But I expect there will be many more additional new species that will be elucidated from our research program. This research has conservation implications because many of these new species are threatened with extinction. And by officially naming them in scientific publications, we bolster ongoing efforts to create more protected areas and national parks in Congo. It has been an honor to teach the next generation of African biologists about field methods in herpetology. But as the habitats for these animals disappear, all of us need to be concerned about conservation. Much of Africa's forests are being destroyed to make way for crops to feed an exploding human population. But at least for now, large areas of wilderness remain in some protected areas of Central Africa. It is very important for the world to protect tropical rainforests in the 21st century because they are slowing the effects of global climate change. The trees and other plants remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere 
and replace it with oxygen. But when the forests are burned down to make way for agriculture, they release enormous amounts of greenhouse gases. By conserving forests all over the world, we save the biodiversity this work is discovering, ensure endangered species have a place to live, create sustainable opportunities for ecotourism that can benefit local people, and help to protect ourselves from the negative effects of climate change. These efforts also ensure that future generations will be awestruck by the beautiful forests I have been admiring for years. Yeah, 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 yeah.